really nice thing to have happen, and I'm really delighted to see you all here. I have pulled down my mask, but I just want you to know that we've, up in the municipal building, have had a little slap from COVID after all this time, so we're, we're using our masks to be precautious, but we've sanitized. I'm not negative, I'm positive. And I'm, excuse me, I'm not positive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not COVID. So anyway, I'm really delighted to see everybody. I'm glad we could kick it off with a little laughter. There is food over there, as you heard Rick announce from Hilmer's and how lovely. I, I did a quick drive-by and it looks very nice. So I encourage everybody to take advantage of that. But I really want to celebrate and welcome everybody. Uh, we're here to talk about the progress in growing Newport's outdoor recreation economy to benefit residents and local businesses. And look how far we've come since 2016. In 2018, the city of Newport's waterfront and downtown master plan identified specific priorities and actions to capitalize on Newport's unique combination of natural amenities for the greater community and economic benefit. We're making progress to those goals, and I'm delighted about how far we've come since 2016. You can click the next. Karen just put this together literally in 10 minutes. And this is our legacy project. This is our, our jewel for the, for the time being. We have more things coming, but right now I want to celebrate this path. That was a really cool picture, too, but this is the result of an incredible collaboration and over one and a half million dollars worth of investment in the Bluffside Connecting Trail, which connects Newport City. It starts right here on this recreational trail and goes uh, to the Beebe Spur, creating a seven mile path from downtown to the Canadian border. Since that time, you can click. I have so many uh, pictures of this, but uh, that, that says it all. Well, it doesn't say it all. There's much more, but you get the idea. And click the next one, please. Can you imagine being in that machine and not being afraid? <laughs> and uh, click the next one. Our, our investment in our intersection at Main Street and Fife is critical because that's literally the gateway to the Gateway Center. And that's taken directly out of our waterfront and master, um, uh, our downtown master plan to create a hub of activity on Main Street the way it was at one time and to draw interest down to the waterfront. Next slide, please. This is a rendition of the parklet that's planned where the seven uh, spaces were taken at the top of um, uh, Fife Drive in the municipal parking lot. This is on deck to happen literally imminently. We're waiting for the contractor who's going to pour the concrete on the, on the ground floor. And uh, the idea of this, of course, when you're driving by, Robert is going to be landscaping it, so it's going to be stunning. And it's going to be very captivating, and it's going to draw interest, and hopefully will be a, a beautiful um, assembly place for, for things that are planned as well as impromptu. And um, be, that will be another source of pride for the city of Newport. Next slide, please. Of course, how beautiful. How beautiful. Tracy's going to talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm actually on Tracy's turf here because that's actually on your side. But it connects to the Prouty side, which is something that's very exciting for us. And that connects to um, the Prouty Beach Campground, which we've been uh, putting a lot of investment in. We've been trying to get these projects done for years, and the fact that they're actually happening. If any of you have a chance to drive through Prouty or participate in some of the amenities there, I think that you'll find there's been a dramatic change over the past two years with more to come. And the next slide, please. Ah, and we're going to talk about that too, which um, I'm raining on your parade now, but you're going to do great. <laughs> we're very excited to see this come back. We've also made improvements at Garden Park. And the waterfront is continuing, and all of this is an effort to climb out of the failure of the EB-5 and create our own identity, to make this a beautiful place that folks can be very proud of. Um, summer 2022 is looking to be the first season where we can fully appreciate the benefits of these investments. 
events and tourists are returning. Today we will hear about what events are on tap for the summer in the downtown, about some exciting things underway to help our community make the most of the investments that have been made. Through the partnerships of the Northern Forest Center, we have also have an opportunity to hear from David Vierl, did I say that right? Who works around the globe with rural communities looking to develop their tourism economies. He will share expertise on what we might expect in, tour in the tourism trends after the pandemic and tell us about how places a lot like Newport are positioning themselves as a travel destination. Thank you all for being here. Now I'd like to introduce you to Rick Hoover Chase from the Newport Downtown Development and Tracy Zhao from the Vermont Land Trust to kick off the program. Tracy, you can go first, thanks. Tracy, you get to go first. <laughs> for those of you who I may not have met. And the Land Trust um, has been partnering in various ways with a lot, of, a lot of folks in this room and elsewhere in Newport uh, since we purchased the former Scott Farm in 2015. Um, and I've had the opportunity since then um, to speak and participate in a number of community conversations in this space um, at the Gateway Center. Um, and what I find so exciting and so gratifying is that each of those meetings has built on the previous one and have each have shown real progress. Um, and I think Newport should be really proud of that, um, especially during a time of uh, the EB-5 disappointments and COVID-19. Um, just the fact that um, today we're here talking about the next phase is, is really exciting. And that's because this group of growing public-private partnerships um, that are leveraging what makes Newport so special, this lake, our location on it, um, are to benefit those who live and work here as well as to uh, drive an economic engine for, for our businesses and attract new businesses, new residents, um, and new visitors to Newport. Um, and looking back over the past six plus years since uh, Vermont Land Trust has been um, able to to be a partner here. I think there's some really key moments um, where um, work at multiple levels, the municipal level, nonprofit, business, and individuals, and those partnerships um, among them have really helped us move this vision um, uh, looking to the lake forward. Um, you know, one of course near and dear to my heart was Vermont Land Trust purchase of Bluffside Farm, um, which was based on really strong community support. Um, but then I think the really key piece of that was um, the listening sessions in 2016 and the strong and consistent community input we got about um, some key projects to put on the front burner, um, namely the, the bluff side, um, a, a connecting waterfront path, connecting Prouty Beach uh, to the BB Spur Rail Trail through the farm. Um, around that same time, the Pomerleau family, that was one of the first times I was participated in an event related to all this here at the Gateway Center, was when the Pomerleau family decided to improve the path in front of Waterfront Plaza. Um, and really, I think, put a stamp on the idea as business people. Um, they also enabled us to start with funders to, um, and in the community, to talk about a phased approach and a collective collaborative approach, which I think really was key to garnering um, the kind of investment we needed here. And then successful events like Wednesday on the Waterfront and Kingdom Games, Men for Maygod Trails, um, you know, coalescing at the same time that Governor Scott created the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative and um, putting more emphasis and, and funding um, and resources behind outdoor recreation as an economic driver. And then Newport's success in garnering a coveted inaugural Vorak grant, which is what um, really funded the, the, the Prouty Pass section that Laura was just showing um, pictures of. Um, and then all that leveraging phase three, um, which was the left side bridge and connecting path and the really considerable federal dollars we were able to attract to Newport to match the state and private funds. Um, and, and across Scott's Cove, which I have to admit, I didn't even think was, I, I really didn't think it was possible until we actually did it. You know, the whole time it just felt like such a huge feat to do. Um, and so it's just so exciting um, to see it now. And I don't know, um, do you want to show that video? Sure. I think most people may have seen this video, but we'll see if 
technology will be on our side. This is just the, yeah, the fast forward, right? Yeah, kind yeah. of fun. Let's see. It literally happened that fast. <laughs> um, and then I think, just lastly, like thinking of these moments, ironically, the COVID pandemic, and you know, as terrible and destructive and so hard on, on so many people as it has been, I think it also gave a bit of a proof of concept for us um, that the value of safe and accessible access to outdoor amenities and, and how treasured they really are and how perfect that we were, this community was investing in that um, at this time. And I've left out lots of other things, other investments, other creative partnerships, but um, I just <coughs> wanted to kind of set the stage that, you know, after now we've attracted all this capital, done some really key infrastructure improvements, have more underway, um, and we can start gathering for outdoor events this summer, you know, how do we keep up the momentum? And that's really the point of this um, this gathering and, and some of the things to talk about is, you know, how do we, the, the vision is now turned to how do we ensure that these investments and efforts really live up to their potential and maximize impact for those who live and work here, as well as um, moving our economy forward. And so this late this fall, early this winter, I can't remember exactly when it was, I was so excited to hear from friends at the Northern Forest Center, um, a, a nonprofit that I've been fortunate to work with um, through my capacity at Vermont Land Trust in a number of different ways, um, all really positive. Um, and one has been through the convenings the Northern Forest Center has done across the Northern Forest region, bringing together the rural communities of New York, Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire together to learn from each other and be inspired about the ways that communities are capitalizing on their natural assets um, to maximum benefit. Um, and some of the key lessons I've learned from those convenings and from the Northern Forest Center's um, resources, learning projects, you know, have, put, have come to bear right here in Newport and in my work with Vermont Land Trust and in other parts of the state. Um, so when they told me that they had a new initiative, um, my ears really perked up. Um, and when I learned um, more about the Rural Tourism Academy and their goal of helping some individual communities here in Vermont um, after successful work in Maine um, to manage and shape the impact of tourism and their recreational economy, I really urged them to consider Newport. It, um, I just and to meet some of the people doing the great work here, um, because in my mind, the timing could not be more perfect. Um, all Newport has been doing to date to get where we are, now is a really key moment to continue that momentum and really make it Newport's own. Um, and so we had some great conversations this winter with a series of partners, and now excited to go out deeper into the community um, and talk about some next steps. And I'll, I'll hand over to Rick to start talking about that. Thank you, Tracy. It's great to be with all of you. My name is Rick Ufford Chase. I'm the director of Newport City Downtown Development. And most of you in the room know, but I'll just say for those few of you who may not, Newport City Downtown Development is a nonprofit organization that partners with the city and the downtown businesses to try to drive economic activity into uh, downtown in the designated area of Newport. I'm thrilled to be doing this work. I've been in this position for about eight months now. And uh, my family, I'm, I'm a relatively new arrival. My family's lived in Lowell for seven generations, and I've been here two or three times a year as an outsider, a flatlander, all of, all of my life. I don't think I've ever missed a Christmas with my cousins in Lowell. Um, but I uh, only moved up here about a year and a half ago, and so glad to be a part of the life of this community with all of you. I want to say just a word about the bones upon which we're building this kind of shared effort again. You know, during the pandemic, it's pretty clear that everybody kind of went into hibernation and survival mode for the better part of a couple of years. And new businesses actually started during that time, which is kind of remarkable. So when I arrived, I couldn't believe it, like a whole length of the block there uh, where the new urgent care center is going in, the UPS store was there before, is all this really cool group of folks, including Rebecca, these kind of young entrepreneurs who are bringing real energy to our town. And I'm so thrilled, I'm so excited about the city of Newport's chances for trying to build those up. So we started really simple in the winter. Uh, we said we were going to build together at the speed of trust. 
And so we started by just trying to get all the businesses to agree on one Saturday a month, we call them Hot Cocoa Saturdays, to do something special on that day along a particular schedule so that if somebody wanted to come into town in the morning and stay through the afternoon, there would actually be a list of different things they could try. And we got some real activity. It's hard to quantify exactly, but um, there's a new website, and the website began to see more traffic. And I think mostly what we did was we built trust with one another. And it's that trust that is the building block for which we're going to kind of build on this summer. And so I want to invite three different people to come up and just say a word about kind of what we're planning for this summer. And then I'll come back and just kind of talk about how those things come together. So I'm going to ask Mike Brown, who is the director of the Recreation Department here in the city of Newport, to say a few words about the city's plans for the summer. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Mike Brown. Thanks, Rick. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am a transplant from Rhode Island, and I came here with my family on vacation pre-pandemic times, and we fell in love with the place, and that's why we're here. We absolutely love Newport and the surrounding area, and when we found the job, when I saw the job for the city on Facebook, I just had to do it. So that's what, this is what drew me to Newport. So I just wanted to start out with that. But we're also very excited about all the events we've got going on this summer. So as you all know, the purpose of those events are to give something new and offer activities for the residents, but it's also to bring outsiders and tourists and visitors to the city to keep them here, to spend money, to go out to dinner, and to help the businesses thrive. And the rec department and NCDD have been cooperating very well together, coordinating calendars, to maximize on these events, so it's been going very good. So let's see, the first very exciting event that we got going on is called the Newport Summer Stroll. So these events will take place the first Saturday of June, August and September, and will be at Gardner Park from seven to 10 o'clock. So basically like dusk till nighttime. So these events will highlight the waterfront, the waterfront along Gardner Park and the point so following the motto, look to the lake. So visitors will be guided down the stroll by fire pits lighting the waterfront to the point. And along the way, we're going to have art displays by Bread and Puppet. So we partnered with them to do static art displays along the stroll. And at the end of the point, we're going to have the wagon stage. And every night, we're going to have local tourists, uh, local artists play music. So in, uh, let's see. So in June, we've got chickweed which is like a local folk band. August, we have the Marcus Daniels Band. And September, we have How To, which is a bluegrass duo. So the next event we have is July 4th. We're calling that Paddle Palooza. It's also gonna be a Gardner Park in the Point. So we're gonna have the Food Truck Alley, and we're gonna have Evansville Transit Authority doing a concert from six to nine. So the stage is gonna be situated so that way people can paddle in that's the Paddlepalooza part. So people can paddle in, enjoy the music, or people can bring blankets and chairs and picnic on the point. And right after the concert, at 9 o'clock, we're going to clear the harbor, and we're going to have the best fireworks display that you guys have ever seen. So that's what we got going on. Yay! Yay. Thanks, Mike. So uh, a couple of months ago, I called... Uh, I think I emailed Andrea uh, Carbine, and I was prepared to beg and grovel uh, <laughs> if I had to to get Wednesdays on the waterfront to come back after a two-year, it's been a two-year hiatus, right? Yes. Um, and Andrea wrote back immediately and said, oh no, Vera and I are actually already making plans and most of the bands are booked and we're ready to move. <laughs> so I was thrilled and I've been like the biggest nag, I think, ever since then saying, when, do, when can I put the word out? I really want to put the word out. And so Andrea and Vera are here today, and Andrea's going to say a few words about Wednesdays on the Waterfront this year and what that's going to look like. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, Wednesdays on the Waterfront is back. Um, we were very well prepared because in 2020, 
Um, Vero had her second daughter in April, so we had to be ready to go for our July start. So we were ahead of the game to start things off, um, and we weren't sure how businesses would react to our asks this time along. Um, we had some who had given money uh, in 2020, and we assured them that it's in the bank and we would be moving forward. Um, some who had who had said that they would donate, but then you know once once COVID hit, we sort of put that on hold. Most of them have come through with what they said they would donate in 2020. Um, we have some who asked for their money back, which we gave back in 2020, and who have given it back to us again. So we've we've kind of gone back and forth, um, but we've had great support from all of our businesses this year, and things are coming along nicely. Um, it's going to look very similar to as it has in the past. We have the Catamount Arts stage, um, and we have six bands. Hopefully, Pick and Shovel is going to be there. I think I, I may have sealed that deal with Greg yesterday. Um, and I think it should be a great turnout. And we do have the band list that Vero can let you know who's playing. Um, a couple of locals, well, mo mostly all locals, a couple that you've seen before, and some um, new bands as well. Back in 2020, we had sort of thought we needed to change it up. We needed to get some new talent. Um, we had an Irish band coming from Boston. We stretched our stretched our um, search for some new music. And then after everything that's gone on, we kind of reeled it back in and said, we need to support those who are local. And it's been a tough couple of, the, couple of years. So every band is from Vermont. Um, some you'll recognize, some new, many from this area, some from Southern Vermont as well. So we'll be starting the concert on July 6th with uh, the Marcus Daniels Band, which they are returning from their last year in 2019. Uh, on July 20th is a Strange Purple Jelly. Then on August 3rd will be the Mike Boudreaux Band, who's coming back too. Um, July 13th is Zuko and the Gang. July 27th will be Rick Reddington and the Love. And we're going to finish the 6th Wednesday on August 10th with um, ETA who uh, were actually the first one to open our concert back in 2017. Yes, they were the first to open and this will celebrate their 20th year, 20th year playing together, so pretty cool. So we're hoping it looks like this every night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Some of you probably know the story way better than I do, but I learned as I got to know Andrea and Vero that this idea for Wednesdays on the waterfront was literally born over a glass of wine in one of their homes one night when they said, hey, we've seen this done in other places. How come we can't do it here? And I just think it's the coolest thing that's happening. It's just like if, if it didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. And speaking of things that we would have to try and invent if it didn't exist, you know, the mantra that everyone agrees on, uh, everyone I've talked with says, yes, we are building around a four season outdoor recreational economy. That's what Newport's future looks like. And so, um, Phil White is here from Kingdom Games, and for my money, nobody's doing more to build that four-season outdoor recreational economy than Phil White and Kingdom Games is doing. I am a proud survivor of the 18-mile version of the Fly to Pie last fall in the mud, uh, which I did before, by the way, I knew about any of this work and before I'd ever met Phil. And uh, so I'm just thrilled that Phil is here to talk a little bit today about the work that they're doing, particularly around building open water competitive swimming as a thing here in the Northeast Kingdom and in Newport. Phil? Thanks. I first arrived in Newport in 1980 as a newly appointed state's attorney for Williams County. And you can see I've matured since then. <laughs> But I fell in love with uh, Newport uh, the minute I first laid eyes on it. I fell in love with the lake, I fell in love with the people, and I was a recreational athlete. Uh, never made a varsity sport in my life, but loved running the roads, swimming in the lakes, and biking the roads. Um, so in my um, most recent life, I started Kingdom Games. Uh, with the goal to build swimming, running, biking, ice skating events um, in the Northeast Kingdom. I didn't think that they would um, take over my life, but they have. 
And I can tell you that as we look at the lake, um, people describe what an asset it is to Newport. Um, we have probably three, four, five hundred swimmers swimming this lake all year round. Um, and um, nobody appreciates the water quality that we have and the lack of boats. I hate to say it because some people complain about it, but it's a swimmer's mecca. And it's become known around the world as one of the hot spots for open water swimming. So this summer we have a big event, um, our biggest event, was, which is Kingdom Swim. And that's on July 23rd. Um, we try to make a celebration around it um, with events going on Friday. Um, we even make an event out of buoy dropping, which is really popular. People sign up for that um, well in advance to make sure that they can go out on the lake and drop the buoys for the swim. Um, it's generated a community of open water swimmers and kayakers, and we're always hungry for boats and kayakers. So any of you who wonder what you could possibly do to support an outdoor recreational community, sign up kingdomgames.co to kayak or to boat for a swimmer or to swim. Um, the other big event we have coming up in May 21st is the Dandelion Run. Uh, it's out of Derby, but we have a uh, dandelion pasta dinner at the east side uh, the night before with Patty Casey and Colin McCaffrey playing. Um, and it's a great way to kick off the dandelion season. It is um, a remarkable shoulder season. Uh, my goal ultimately is to build a dandelion festival around um, our world famous dandelion fields in this area. Uh, the other uh, big event, well it's not so big an event, but uh, we do have a July 4th uh, Harry Coral Freedom Run. We donate those funds to um, the Vermont uh, uh, Mental Health Association for suicide prevention. Um, we donate probably six to ten thousand dollars every year to local charities. And then in the fall, we have um, uh, the uh, Fly to Pi leaves from uh, the Northeast Kingdom International Airport and ends up at Parker Pie with all the pizza you can eat. And we have camping offered up at the airport. And all these events, even if they're taking place in the surrounding areas, uh, people come in and they use the uh, lodging and inns uh, in the area. Uh, we generate about uh, $150,000 in revenues ourselves. But we estimate that the impact um, financially for the area is about a million dollars a year. Uh, we strive for the great return. Um, we love to serve local folks, don't get me wrong. Um, we're accessible to all levels and all ages, but we go for the great return. And what we see is the first time people come into the area, uh, they come in the night before and they leave the night the day after the event on their own. The next year they come back with family and they come in for a few days and um, stay a little longer. And then they start forming little tribes. I call them scalawags. And they come back with, we have people driving from Ohio to swim in the winter swim and also to swim in the summer swim and they're the Buckeye Blue Tips. And these women, uh, they will drive to Newport for the fun of it. So what we're looking to do is create celebrations around these events so that they're distinctive from every other kind of event. And We've seen that Newport has an awful lot to offer uh, these events, and so we're looking to build celebrations around them. Thank you, Paul. So there you have it. Those are the events that are lined out for the coming summer, and if you add them all up, they add up to about 12 or 13 days of events that are taking place between the beginning of July. Actually, if you count the uh, the first summer stroll, it really starts the beginning of June and goes through uh, Labor Day weekend. So I'm thrilled that we have something to build on and Newport City Downtown Development is working with a variety of partners to try and actually build a social media campaign out about that stuff and to really get people to come on those particular days so that if you drive from further away, you feel like there's some there there when you get to Newport. We know that what we're building for eventually is the ability for somebody to drop in any time during the day or the evening and know that there's activity that they can be involved in in downtown Newport. And this summer, we really want to build around those events. 
And having said that, I want to go back to the waterfront path for a moment. Tracy's going to speak a little bit about the, the first half of our project with the waterfront path and the Rural Tourism Academy, and then I'll share a little bit about that. Because it's also true that we need things that are always available to folks who drop in, right? And that they know they can, they can access, like the Northern Star or the, or the path. So Tracy, would you say a word about that, please? It was so exciting to hear about all the fun stuff this summer. I'm so excited. Um, so, uh, you know, as we were saying, you know, a lot about this gathering is talking about what next and how to leverage the investments that have already happened. And so, when we started talking to the Northern Forest Center, which I, they, they're kind of in the background today, but I just want to point out maybe they can wave. Um, Amy Scott, Mike Wilson, and Joe Short um, from the Northern Forest Center. We started meeting, and as well with with David um, this winter, started talking about you know what are some ways to move um, to move some key pieces forward, um, and one is uh, to make sure now that we have built and connected a seven-mile waterfront recreation path that people actually know how to get to it and uh, follow the various pieces that are owned by different entities. Um, and to know how to get off it for parking and bathrooms and businesses. Um, really a key next step because if you're if you're in the know, it's great. If you're not, you can get you can get lost um, pretty quickly. And so to really activate that path for everyone, um, that's a really key project. So there's a couple things happening. One was the Northern Forest Center was willing to be the lead applicant um, in partnership on a grant to USDA Rural Development, um, RDBG, which is a funder that has funded, actually supported quite a few things here in Newport. Um, they were a funder of um, some of the work related to the REC Pack itself, but on a comprehensive wayfinding and signage strategy. So really getting in some expert advice and planning around signage that will really work well um, and really direct people and, and really maximize um, connecting businesses to the path and, and vice versa. Um, so that application has been submitted, um, worked hard to make it as competitive as possible, and really thankful to the Northern Forest Center for being the, the lead there. Um, and I think we'll hear in the summer um, about that grant, um, and I think all the pre-work that went into it uh, really sets us up well if, if that grant doesn't come through to continue to, to put together a competitive package for, for funding for that. Um, and of course it's in partnership with the city, Newport. Um, but we also recognize that summer is around the corner. Today, you really feel like it is around the corner. Um, a couple days ago, maybe not so much. Um, but uh, really rec realizing that, as, as um, Phil said, you know, when people come this summer, we want them to have a really good experience and to want to come back and build on that relationship with Newport. And so um, Rick's going to talk about some immediate work we're doing um, for, for this summer with, uh, with the Northern Forest Center. Yeah. So, yeah, we wanted to be able to show some immediate kind of payoff for the work that we're doing to collect together through the Rural Tourism Academy. And with a grant from Northern Forest Center, uh, we've actually signed a contract to create a new map that will show the entire trail and the, vi the various amenities and feeders to the trail all the way from the Canadian border to right here for that seven mile long thing. And it will show where the businesses are located because part of what we want, obviously, is for people to be able to find their way to the trail. So our dream is they're walking down the street where they duck into a, a, a shop or a restaurant in Newport and say, oh my gosh, look what's here. We could spend the next two hours on this beautiful day checking out the trail. And they can go around the corner to the great outdoors where Nate will be renting bicycles this summer, right? And access the trail on a bike if they want. So the idea is to make it an impulse possibility for folks but also for folks who may come down from Canada or others who may come just for the trail, we want them to know what's going on in downtown Newport and how do we find those businesses as well. So the idea is to go both directions. So the map will be produced. We are on a very aggressive timeline. And so far, no one's told us it's impossible to try and have that, that map in our hands by the, fir the 1st of July so that we can highlight it and put them out all over during the 4th of July celebration sponsored by the city. Um, and then the second thing we're doing is any of you who have actually tried to use the path from here, particularly from here over to Bluffside, 
and from Bluffside over to where the BB Spur Trail picks up, or down the road in front of the hospital. It can be challenging if you don't know where the path is already. So although we have a long-term wayfinding strategy that we're building toward, it's likely that if, even if everything breaks our way, that's a two to three year project. So we said, okay, we're gonna take some of the money that the Northern Forest Center gave us and turn it into just quick, down and dirty directional signs that we will put up along with easy to find and use map holder kiosks, little just plastic or something, we haven't designed it yet. An area where people can pick up a map and when they come across the causeway, there will be a simple sign that says, go to the right and then down along the path. Or if you want to check out the little spur trail behind the waterfront plaza, you can. But it will all be marked so that people can find their way on and off. And just one last word about that. This, what we're dreaming of, I've been in conversation with some folks over at uh, Northern, uh, North Country Career Center, and we're hoping that the juniors and seniors at North Country Career Center will actually help us with producing those signs and getting them placed as kind of the last thing that they do is their semester uh, before school's over this time. Uh, so, so we'll see if that all comes together. It's, I think it's quite likely. All the pieces seem to be falling into place so that the trail will be accessible this summer. So with that, I know we've done a lot of the talking. Um, I'll just pause there for a moment and ask if anybody has any questions about what we've talked about so far. And then we'll take a break for a few minutes while David sets up to do his talk. Uh, which will be much more engaging around kind of what's the future of this kind of building a, a, an economy around tourism. Questions or comments? Rick, what was the name of the first event you talked about uh, The summer strolls with the city? Right. Summer strolls, right. So Mike's got this, and those will be, Mike, tell me if I get this wrong, the first Saturday of each month starting in June, except for the 4th of July weekend when the focus will be on Monday, July 4th itself. So there'll be three of those this summer. Yes? Can I put a little plug in for the tour boat? Yes. So thank you. You want to just come do that quickly? That's Dave, right? Yes. I want to make sure I had it right behind the mask, Dave. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Sorry. So I'm Dave Converse, uh, native here. I grew right up over here on Ferris Point and uh, currently the president of Pemberbingo Community Maritime, which owns the tour boat. So um, it's been a long struggle. We, uh, we were not able to cruise in 2020, but uh, last year we started cruising at the end of May on Memorial Weekend. And as they say, you don't know what you don't know, because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know how things are going to work out. But we have an excellent captain. He came up from South Carolina. He's a yacht captain from down to the Florida area. And he's been all over. He's, he's cruised about every sea there is, about, except for two or three. But he's, he liked it here. He's coming back. He wanted a, a nicer, easier summer job for a while. And um, so we've got plans. Uh, again, we're going to expand our cruising season. We're going to start on Wednesdays now, and part of that is so we can bring people out, park out, listen to Wednesdays on the waterfront on the boat. And uh, we'll have theme cruises again, um, dinner cruises, and breakfast cruise on Sundays. And um, For our first year, we were really pleased. We, we, now we know a little bit more about it, but um, for our first year of cruising, and I, if you want to say 12 weeks or so of cruising, we took out 5,500 passengers. I think that's pretty good. So uh, that's about a 92% capacity on the boat full time. So it's here, it's here to stay. It's the ideal boat for this area. Um, it's time that we've had another cruise boat on the lake that was successful and, you know, Hundred years ago, we had one, but it was a big time span between now and then. And uh, especially with the uh, border opening up, the Canadians coming down again. Hopefully, that'll help us out to do some more. Um, just to plug, if we are looking for crew people, um, we need to expand the amount of crew people we had from last year. So, if you know of any college people that might be looking, it's, it's kind of a fun job, and uh, we have a lot of fun on the boat. 
think you have to have a really good, happy personality, and it's a fun boat to be in. So, anyway, we're looking forward to it. So before I took this job with NCDD, I just want the record to reflect, Dave, that I took family who visited me last summer three times on the Northern Star. And I, I just thought it was fabulous. Every time we did it, it was a great time. And there was a different meal from a different restaurant every time I did it, which was part of the fun, actually, for us. So it was really great. One last thing about all of this, one piece that ties it all together. If you have not lately taken a look at the website, discovernewportvt.com, you should do so. Um, I can take no credit for this because it was work done by the board of Newport City Downtown Development before I came on, but it's a fabulous website and it's got, it's got a new calendar function on it that we're just beginning to populate so that it will be the go-to spot so anyone coming into town or staying in an Airbnb or in one of the cottages up on the lake can say, oh, I wonder what's going on in Newport tonight and go to one spot and find all the activities that are in Newport and the surrounding area. So. Just keep, keep an eye on that. Always willing to take your suggestions about how to improve the website and the calendar and happy to put up events. We're really looking for events for that that have an, an impact on drawing people to the downtown area. So that's businesses and nonprofits and organizations that are really drawing folks in. That's what we're looking for. So having said all of that, let's take a about a five or seven minute break. Please eat some food that Travis and Luther brought for us. I don't know where they are, but Travis, thanks for the food. And help yourself to food and lemonade. Use the bathroom quickly, and then David will begin in about uh, seven or eight minutes. Okay, everybody, so let's, um, let's regroup. All right, so uh, my name is David Burrell, um, and I wanted to just talk a little about uh, sustainable tourism. So I want to present some kind of data points, but then I want to have a conversation with you um, about the notion of sustainable tourism and why we might be talking about that today. So obviously some fascinating stuff going on here. I mean the presentation of the trail and the projects for summer, all fantastic stuff. Um, one of the things that we've been doing with the Northern Forest Centre and the Rural Tourism Academy is looking a little further down the track. So to really try and understand where are we going with tourism in these rural and regional destinations. Obviously, it's a key economic driver, but we also just want to kind of look a little further uh, down the track. Um, so part of what we're doing is what we call future thinking, and it's this kind of process of thinking a bit about evolution. So what might tourism look like? What might tourism's impact in our communities look like? you know, in the near future, medium term, and longer term. Uh, and the, the keys to future thinking really come down, in my book, to two things. So one is trajectory, and one is velocity. So trajectory is what direction are we heading, and being thoughtful and intentional about that. And then is velocity, which is how fast do we want to, or do we need to move? So trajectory and velocity. And I want to talk about those in the context of uh, how tourism might play out. Um, but of course, we're in this really interesting time, and I wish we could say we were at the end of the pandemic, but we're probably still in the pandemic, um, and that brings with it a lot of uncertainty. Obviously, it's been a massive disruption, um, but it's worth thinking about, as we kind of look to the future a little, what trends are being amplified and accelerated as a function of the pandemic? So think about tourism, in particular, but also life in communities, what's being amplified and accelerated, uh, what changes might be more elastic, so in other words, what things may have changed a little bit, but they're going to snap back when things return to normal, or do they snap back, or do we see permanent changes, um, and where might there be potential tipping points, and I want to talk a little about this um, as we sort of think about future trajectories. Uh, but from some of the work uh, we've done, here are some trends that are clearly being amplified and accelerated. Um, and relevant to today, one is outdoor recreation and the importance of public spaces. There is no doubt at a macro level that the whole notion of how people use public spaces and how people are recreating has absolutely changed dramatically. 
and, and we're going to see how that might play out you know, as the pandemic sort of unfolds. But this summer will be very interesting. Um, cities have been reinventing themselves. I'm going to talk a little about this, but most people live in city, cities now. So one of the things that the pandemic has really triggered um, is a real rethink about cities and city life. Uh, application of automation and robotics, uh, workplace and workforce transformation, this whole notion of hybrid work, clearly a, a trend that being amplified, accelerated, and of course online commerce and retail, um, and so on. Um, but I want to back up a little and I want to talk about some high level things, right? And at first you're probably going to go, what the hell is this Australian guy talking to me about this for, right? But I will bring it to ground so that it makes absolute sense, right? But I want to first of all talk about demographics, population, and mass urbanisation. And I'm going to start really big picture. Um, so this is a data line here from 1950 to 2050. And that curve there is the population of people on the planet. Um, and I picked this 100 year period because it is absolutely a profoundly transformational period for human beings. Um, so looking around the room, some of us were born down that end towards 1950s, right? Hopefully we all make it to the 2050. Um, but we're obviously moving through this global population change. Interestingly, we have just past a point where there are now more people on the planet who live in urban environments than live in rural environments. So hands up for people in this room if you were born in a rural environment, so a small town or a country area or a rural area, okay? How many people were born in a big urban environment? Okay, so about half and half, right? So, so that's where we kind of add, but we've passed this point and the green line at the top is the urban environment and that's going to accelerate. So the number of people who on the planet who live in cities is starting to accelerate. What does this look like at a macro scale and then what does it mean locally is what I want to talk about. So this is a um, schematic of the world. So North America on the left here, uh, Europe here, Asia and so on here. Um, the size of the bubbles represents the population of people living in cities of over 100,000 people, okay? And this is 1950 data, okay? So 1950, at that point, the United States had 100 million, 101 million people uh, living in cities, about 64% urbanized, right? So probably something a bit like this room, about half and half, you know, people living in cities, people living in uh, rural areas. Um, and remember, this is urban centers of over 100,000 people. That's 1950, and you can see the world, right? That's 2020. So there's this absolute explosion of the size of urban populations, the number of people living in cities. So if I toggle back, 1950, and that's a very familiar world to us, and a lot of your infrastructure in a community like this was really, hasn't changed a huge amount since then, but this is what the world looks like. And then if you go forward to 2050, it just blows up even more. So we're at the point now where we have nearly 300 million people living in cities in the US and it's 85% urbanised. And before long, it will be 90% urbanised. And that number is we are adding to cities in this country 50,000 people a week net. Okay? What does that mean for Newport? That's what we want to bring to ground, right? So, for sure, the population of the country is different and more and more people are going to have their entire life in city environments. All right, so here's what's going on, right? So increasingly people are clustering into these uh, metropolises. There's innovation occurring at all these different levels. Um, there's suburban areas are starting to undergo a lot of change, the peri-urban space. And then you've got this area beyond the big cities. And my question is, are these, these are ultimately a production zone, so they could be forestry or agriculture, whatever, but also really important recreation areas. And the challenge is, are you an outdoor recreation area wonderland, or are you a blast zone from one of those metropolitan centres? Because what we're seeing over and over is that these big cities, what happens? 
is you get this surge of people who often don't really understand rural and regional areas, travelling out, recreating, using that space, and then going back. And so for some communities, they feel like they're in a blast zone. So if you go to communities that are an hour out of a big metropolis, small rural communities, now we've got all these people living in this city, they all come out here to recreate, they start to feel like a blast zone. Part of the challenge for your community, with all the great stuff you've got going on, is how do you thread the needle to be able to build the benefits from tourism, but also maintain your quality of life and your experience as a community? Um, so another change, big change that's occurring, which is going to be upon us in the uh, short term, this is middle class consumer spending power. Um, a map of the world here, colour coded to this pie chart. Um, the inner circle here in the pie chart is the middle class consumer spending power in 2009 in US trillions of dollars, right? So 2009 is the inner circle, and the outer ring here um, is 2030. So we're obviously in the middle of that time period. What you can see, um, you can see the colours there, there's almost no change in the middle class consumer spending power in North America, a little bit in Europe, but it's all dwarfed by this massive change in that middle class consumer spending power in the Asia Pacific region. And so this, and why middle class consumer spending power is an interesting number, because as soon as people hit middle class, they have disposable income. And guess what they start to do? They start to buy stuff and they start to travel. So this might give us a clue about, at a macro sense, uh, what future travel might look like, although there's a lot to play out still in that. Um, another piece, it's the last piece of the kind of the big macro trends I want to talk about, um, is this profound demographic shift that's underway in society, right? So I'm going to talk about it at a large scale. Think about what that might mean for Newport. Um, and I pulled figures here uh, from the UK and from the United States. The United States is on the right here. Um, these are what they call age pyramids. So they're four-year increments stacked up, uh, male and female. Um, and where these red arrows are, these are where these shoulders are, or these bubbles. So this is the millennial population, and this is the baby boomer population. Um, and what we're going to see in the next decade is a really profound shift in terms of influence in society. So we're going to see baby boomers cycle out of key roles and responsibilities, and we're going to see the millennial and other generational cohorts come into the foreground. What does that mean, right? And what does that mean in terms of your visitation? So in the short term, you could probably think, oh, that's great because baby boomers are kind of in retirement, early retirement, active retirees. Great, they might travel, they might come to somewhere like Newport. Millennials, great, out into outdoor recreation, fantastic. You know, there might be people who are traveling and you know, remote work and so on. Um, but what we're going to think about is, that might be great for five years, but then what happens in the five years after that and the five years after that? Um, but the thing I think that will surprise us all to the um, upside is shifting societal values, right? And I use these advertising um, pictures to explain that. So the one on the left says, blow on her face and she'll, she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> And the one on the right is talking about how soon should the baby start to drink cola. <laughs> now, we laugh, right? But that stuff's not really that old. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, smoking went from being apparently very appealing to illegal. And that's a shifting societal value. So what happens when we have a rapid demographic shift where we have one generational cohort replacing another generational cohort in positions of influence, what societal value shifts might we see in the next decade? And think of societal values also reflected in taste, appetite, consumption and so on. Um, but what do you think might be some of the societal value shifts that we could see that would be worth taking account of? Well, I can't predict exactly, but in the last couple of years we've seen the Me Too movement, 
a few events trigger a global reckoning. Black Lives Matter, an incident, triggers a reconciliation around the world. And I would argue they're just the start. So how do we think about preparing ourselves if we're in a visitation economy for shifts in societal values and appetites and tastes? But for sure, future travels will be different. So the challenge is, how do we design products and experiences that suit those emerging desires and tastes? How do we anticipate those? And how do we start to get ready for them? Last piece, right? The big picture stuff, right? Um, this is a kind of a little bit of a left field, but I'll be interested to see what your reaction to this is, right? So this is some modeling that looks at the long-term impact of climate change, right? Um, the, the green areas is where the forecast is for agricultural productivity, biomass productivity to increase as a result of climate change, and the red is areas where the forecast is that it will decrease. So in other words, it's not even, right? So as climate change unrolls across the world, we're going to see some areas productivity will actually increase and some areas where productivity will rapidly decline. Um, what does that mean for the US? What does that mean for here? Well, interestingly, the reds and the blues here um, are the highest biomass produced, producing areas in the US. And I should have added here, if you look at the US, the northern latitudes or the northern half of the US is where there will be likely positive gains in terms of biomass production as a result of climate change. The south is where you'll have need. Um, but interestingly, the Midwest, which is the big food basket, and this little corner up here, I find really intriguing because that's where the biomass is produced in this country and that's where the gains will be over time. What might that mean in some surprising ways uh, for your community, the economy in this area, and so on. And I want to add one last piece, right? So this is some long-term modelling that looks at um, GDP impact, so economic activity, impact of climate change over time in the US. And this takes into account all sorts of stuff, including uh, the effect of weather events on people's productivity, temperature, all that stuff. The red is where it's going to get a negative impact, and the green is where there'll be a positive impact. And again, I'm kind of intrigued by this area up here. And I wonder if we're not on the start of a couple of things. So one, where people want to go and recreate might start to change. People are not going to go into a blazing hot, environment to do physical recreation if it gets hotter and hotter. Also, we might be on the start of seeing a migration pattern change in this country, where people may start moving south to north. And so, what does that mean for the future of your community? Right, so what are some macro tipping points, right? High level stuff here, right? Um, societal values for sure. I think that's going to be really interesting and when you think about evolution of your community and tourism, how do you start to think about shifting societal values? Workplace and workforce reinvention. Um, probably still a fair way to play, but clearly there's been uh, a semi-permanent change in people and where they work. So does that start to drive your local economy, your visitation economy in a different way where people are able to come here and work and stay and so on. Um, people are more living in insular bubbles, environmental awareness, we've clearly got a reckoning of that coming uh, in the next uh, years. Um, transformation of industrial systems. Right, so let's talk about tourism, right? So part of the theme here is sustainable tourism. So with that macro set of trends, which I would actually argue are predominantly incredibly positive for a community like yours. You know, a community that has great assets, uh, wonderful recreation, is in an area that's going to probably uh, benefit from climate change, uh, offers a lot of things, you can become really, really attractive. Um, what I want to lay out here a little is the sort of notion of be careful what you wish for, or be careful what you plan for, right? And we're talking about future direction of tourism. 
And there's this notion of, can tourism ever be truly sustainable? And right now, if you're following it, there's a massive rethink going on in tourism and destinations around the world. So a lot of destinations who are very dependent on tourism as part of their economic driver are really wondering, wow, that was kind of nice not having people all over us for two years. How do we have a little bit more of that as we go forward? So there is a really serious rethink going on about visitation, about how destinations handle visitation, and how we might be able to influence the traveller so that they're more empathetic to the locations they travel to. So you've got to remember, we've increasingly got people coming from cities who may not have a connection to a, an area like this, but they're going to come and use this area. So how do we sort of get that, thread that needle going forward? Um, and I want to now talk a bit about sustainable tourism as an approach, right? And one of the things that I hear over and over, right, and we've heard this in the communities we're working with here, whether it's in Maine or, or um, the Kingdom <coughs> Corridor, you know, the Kingdom Corridor up through um, uh, Burke and so on, or in Gorham, um, people are talking about how do we get the balance right? And so if in a real layman's language I could talk about what does sustainable tourism mean and how do you think about this going forward, is how do you get the balance right between the positive benefits of visitation and the tourism economy and the impacts on your community? How do you get that balance right in a way that suits you, in a world that's changing? And in this uh, sort of diagram here, we're talking about the balance between industry values, so in other words, an industry that's often perceived to be extremely to very important, that creates economic activity, creates jobs, um, tourism product that's built on local values and traditional environments, high quality natural resources, that benefit, how do we balance that with the community impacts of potential environmental concerns? So where landowners and residents start to get concerned about too much, in the wrong place, the wrong time, whatever. People and communities are struggling to cope with the rate of influx. You may not have got to the, 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 the point of this yet, but if I take you to some communities that are within an hour of Metropolis, they'll talk about the rate of influx. You know, when you have large urban populations and they're travelling out to recreate, can create some tension points. And ultimately, the, the worst case scenario is you get a disruption to people's quality of life and their sense of contentment. So part of thinking about tourism and the evolution, and part of what we're doing in these rural tourism academies, is trying to help communities figure out what does that balance look like for you? And it's going to be different for every community, but going to have to have those sort of tough conversations. Um, the framework, um, that we're using, and this is sort of a working definition, is got sort of five points to this notion of sustainable tourism, um, and it's this idea of if we can evolve tourism in the ideal way that we thought was truly sustainable for us, what would it look like? So one um, is where we integrate tourism with local communities in a respectful and functional way. So in other words, you don't end up being a prop in a sideshow, but your tourism economy relates to you and treats you in a very respectful and functional manner. Um, it provides visitors with authentic experiences that are grounded in local realities. So in other words, they come, they get a real taste of it, but they also have an understanding of what is and is not possible in a location, say like Newport, you're not going to get everything here, right? You're not going to get blazing high-speed Wi-Fi and you know phone coverage everywhere. That's just the reality, but people understand that. It creates lasting financial and social benefits for local residents. So in other words, a sustainable tourism model distributes benefit deeply into the community fosters strong public policies with organisational support and funding. So we've heard examples of that today. Where you've got organisational support, policies, investments in trails and so on, um, and contributes to the health and vibrancy of the natural environment. And I want to probe a little bit today with you um, these definitions, but I have a couple of questions, right? Um, 
So we want to do a quick poll here, right, and then have a discussion about it, right? So if you were to think about tourism and its relationship to the future of Newport, um, how important do you think tourism is to the future of Newport and the area, right? So the scale is one, not at all important, through to extremely important. I'm going to do a show of hands here, right? So we're going to do a, a quick and dirty rapid poll, right? So if you think about tourism, how important it is to the future of Newport, Hands up if you're saying not at all important, not so important, somewhat important, very important, extremely important. Okay, so <coughs> most people are very important, some people are extremely important, right? So we established that this is a really key economic driver, right? So let's play a little around some ideas about how it could evolve and get some reaction to that, right? So one of the things that we've been um, sort of working with the other communities, so like I said, Burke and St. Johnsbury's and all the way through into Maine, Gorham and so on, is thinking about this focus or around visitation and management. So there's this notion of you can have a tourism growth focus and that's where you're just solely focused on increase the numbers. Okay? Tourism growth. That's what we're concerned about. We just want to grow it. Number of people, churn it, grow it. The other end of this continuum is what we call a destination management focus, um, which is more about intentionally guiding and managing the local impacts of tourism and tourists. So it's not saying no tourism, because we know it's very important, but it's, is our focus going forward about growing the number of visitors, or is it guiding and managing the local impacts of tourism and tourists? So that's a scale, right? One to ten, right? So where do you think would be the place where Newport region should aim if you think out sort of five or ten years into the future? Is it tourism growth focus at one end extreme or a destination management focus or is it some sort of combination if you slide up and down that? knowing it's a scale, right? So I'm going to ask the question and we'll have some discussion. So I'm going to start with one, so just hands up if you're one, two, three, four, eight, through to ten, right? So hand up if you think that the future, um, uh, the Newport region should aim on one, tourism growth focus, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so one. So we have one at three and one at ten, but most people are around seven, right? Why is that? Why did you pick that spot? Why do you think that should be where Newport aims? Please. So you want to maintain quality of life for um, residents year-round. We don't want to become a blast zone. Avoid blast zone. Yeah, so it requires some intentional thinking about how you manage that. Now, we were just talking about this earlier, and I would guess for a lot of communities, and you're a really attractive community, and you're actually not that far from an urban centre if you go that way, right? Um, and, and the world's coming to you, right? So while you, know, you haven't yet felt the full impact, so you're still kind of craving some of the benefits, but the, the full impacts look different if you're closer today, right, to a big centre. Um, I'm guessing you probably know a lot of communities it's 10 years from embracing tourism to being a blast zone. And on one hand, 10 years might sound like a long time, right? But it's not really that long. It's a couple of election cycles, right? And that's how fast it can move. So there's a, if there's anything I'm trying to communicate with you today, it's the, the need to think intentionally about how you're building your future. All the stuff you're doing is fantastic, right? But you've got to really have your eye on where you want to end up so you don't make unintended errors or you start to think about how do we handle visitation when we have 50% more visitors? Or what happens if we have 100% more visitors? How do we deal with that? Right? So managing that for the preservation of your sense of community, to paraphrase what you said, is really important to you. Right? 
some other other people, other thoughts. Why did you pick that spot? Or why did you pick three or ten? What's your what's driving your thoughts? Yes, please. Are those two things mutually exclusive? Why can't they happen at the same time? Yeah. So we try. I know they could. We try to lay out a continuum, right? So you can have a destination management focus but also be growing your tourism at the same time, right? So it's probably more additive running this way, but it's just like, are, are we just extremely looking one direction or the other, right? Mm -hmm. But other thoughts, why did you peg your responses where you did? Yeah, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then I, it's been my experience that um, just observing uh, businesses, especially retail businesses, have, a, have trouble when they focus too much on because it's fantastic in the tourist months, and then it, you have the shoulder months, the months that are quite as, as strong. So it's hard to it's hard to have a good business model focused on that. Whereas if you figure out more of a destination management, I think it's spread out, and the tourist months become a bonus for the businesses. <laughs> and it just seems to have to be a little bit more even keel. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Very clear. Uh, who, who's next? Yes, please. Balance, because if you pick a balanced place, you have the opportunity of engaging community. And if you don't engage community, then you don't have very much. You don't have a heartbeat anymore. And you need the heartbeat. Yeah, and actually, you're so right about if you don't engage the community, you can kind of sort of lose that heartbeat. Right. But actually, you can go even further. and. And when I talk about communities that are a blast zone, I'm now talking about communities that are saying, no more tourists. Mm -hmm. Like communities that go, okay, this was great, but now we want to stop. <laughs> go away, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's resident alienation is that term, when people just get sick of it, and that's where you get a degradation of their quality of life and so on. Yeah. And I think that for, for all destinations that have amenities like this, that's part of what you've got to be figuring out all the time, right? What is that balance going for? What's that line that we can intentionally be building the benefits, but not lose sight of our community and the impacts on residents, or else you start to lose support? Now, you're not there yet, right? But you could be at some point, right? And that's sort of what we're trying to open the door for. Okay, anybody else want to weigh in on this, in terms of why you pegged your thoughts where you did? Okay. Um, let me talk about or ask about collaboration. One of the things why I'm asking this is that um, almost every regional community we've worked with or are working with in, around wrestling with the challenge of the tra trajectory of tourism, collaboration comes up in terms of how we work together internally and how we work with the areas around us, right? So I want to ask about um, your thoughts about collaboration here. So if you think over the next 10 years, where do you think Newport region should aim on a continuum from, so ad hoc collaboration on the left, so the primary focus is on driving local benefit and meeting individual objectives. So in other words, our focus is on those benefits. We'll collaborate if we need to, right, essentially, um, to an intentional collaboration where there's a, from the get-go, a strong focus on building regional collaboration and connectivity across the region. So thinking about not just the, the city or town of Newport, but the sort of area around it and the sort of catchment of where people um, are connected to, right? Ad hoc collaborations, one. Intentional collaborations, 10, right? And we're probing this because um, ad hoc collaboration, actually, for a lot of cases, for a lot of people, that's pretty easy, right? I'm mostly going to be concerned about myself and my benefits, and I'll collaborate when I have to, right? The intentional collaboration is more upfront building connections and considering that there's going to be a payoff from that. So if you think about the Newport region, looking forward, who's on, let's start at one. So who's on one, two, three, four, Five, okay, getting some fives, six, seven, okay, eight, nine, 
10. Okay? So, 5 this way, right? Um, why did you peg where you did? What was your rationale? Please. Well, <clears throat> collaborative sounds great if you have people um, who want to collaborate, want to share, uh, want to give, hear the other people and listen and act together. The downside of collaboration is if someone sort of takes over uh, control in some way and then it doesn't feel as good and that can happen in group settings. So while I would like you to go more, <laughs> I wind up in the middle. So you're, you pick a five or a six, something I like that? I picked five. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a really interesting point. I think that's part of what we're probing here, or I'm probing, is the notion of the difference between it sounds good versus what am I giving up and at what point are we at, right? So why would I collaborate is sort of the underlying piece of this, right? So nicely explained. Somebody else, other people, where did you put your response and why in terms of from ad hoc to intentional collaboration? Please. Um, I chose 10 because um, since I'm on the planning commission, we have to think of the welfare of all of Newport, not just one segment of it, um, which means that uh, that underscores our mission of planning, is how are things going to impact the whole community? Um, is, are things going to be equaled out? Are some people going to be negatively affected and others more positively? How do we preserve our natural attractions? And um, sometimes this may mean that some people feel like they can't make the usage that they want to, um, where others may feel like, well, you know, we share during the summer, the rest of the time the lake is ours or whatever. Um, so it's more like an overview of the whole community and how it's impacted, and not just the businesses, not just uh, people that are in the service industries and things like that. Yeah, and it's really interesting because that balance and that trade-off you talked about will get harder the more the change occurs. Mm -hmm. You know, the fastest change comes at you, the more challenges you have managing that trade-off becomes more nuanced or more complex. Thank you. Somebody else, where did you peg your thoughts on collaboration? Where should Newport Region aim and why? Yes, please. Yeah. So I was also closer to 10, um, just thinking that just using our areas and examples no one, in terms of communities, no one community generally in this area can meet all the needs of the visitor population coming in. And so if you think about Newport being nested in the larger Northeast Kingdom, then being nested within, say, the state of Vermont, and then the larger northern New England, <coughs> sort of those concentric circles that can help sort of mitigate some of the impact, help lessen the burden on individual communities, and yet still offer um, opportunities for experience that the region can benefit from. Um, that's where I see the benefit of this sort of intentional uh, collaboration across the region for especially small communities like Newport. Yeah, and that's that's really great that you kind of extended that out, right? Because part of the, the challenge is that visitors aren't as concerned about the boundaries between communities as you are, right? And so they're going to tend to be more visiting regionally. So that's going to be part of the work of the Northern Forest Centre in terms of coordinating or connecting the actions between these different communities so that there's a way, way maybe at a macro level to think about what is the shared story about the whole Northeast Kingdom or the you know, New England region? You know, what, what's the shared sort of aspirational behaviours you'd want visitors to have, for example? You know, this whole idea of being able to think about you know, telegraphing and communicating with people before they come. All right, good, thank you for that, right? So I wanna just go back to one thing, right? So 
Um, so we talked about this sort of sustainable tourism. I talked about those two big kind of macro themes. I want to just talk a bit about practically how communities are putting this on the ground, right? And then I have just a, another couple of questions. So uh, we've been doing some work in Gorham, uh, New Hampshire. I think it has a lot of similarities to here in terms of, you know, it's a smaller community. It's got some, you know, connection to other big things that are going on. Uh, we've been through some planning work with them. And I pulled this one out because it's relevant and close, but also the key pillars, if you call them that, the sort of big framework for action, um, really, I think, is the kind of best practice. So what they worked through was they said, OK, we want to build a sustainable tourism approach, and we want to get that balance just right. They first of all figured out what that would look to them. Um, one of their big things is to collaborate, to figure out how to collaborate inside their community. Particularly, that was picking up um, some of the potential divisions between motorised and non-motorised recreation. Right? So they, got, they saw some potential challenges there, but they wanted to keep working together. Uh, educate visitors. So in other words, in a sustainable tourism model, there is this opportunity to think about how do we educate people before they get here? So how do we prepare them for how to behave, what we're about, how to come and join us, how to be part of the solution before they even get here? Uh, diversify and deepen experiences. So this idea of being able to get people more steeped in the, the local context, the culture, the history, the experiences here. Um, this one I found fascinating, right? And this, I want to just talk a little about this one in a second, but the last one here was create, connect to the regional network, so to just what we were talking about. Um, but if I come back to this create management systems, um, so I've been working in a lot of destinations across the US, regional and rural destinations for like, you know, decades around how to manage tourism, right? Until about, and I keep saying it's three years ago, and it was really just before the pandemic, but it certainly got stronger from then, right? But up until that point, people were sort of saying, yeah, we can't tell people what to do, right? You know, we can't really put in place management controls because it's kind of not American, right? You know, it's like people want to do what they want to do when they want to do it, so on. Um, and, but you, you can see destinations have management systems in place in places like Europe and elsewhere. You know, people have been doing it for a long time. What is really interesting in the last three years that that story has changed. More and more people are now saying, not only do we want to, but we need to have management systems in place. We actually need to be able to put in place ways to be able to separate potential conflicts and be able to spread impact but actually do it in a way where we're telling people where to go, where not to go, and we're really doing it very intentionally. Um, so that's something that I think as you think about tourism going forward, that notion of management systems uh, could become really important. Right? And I think it's actually like an essential part of the narrative going forward. All right, my last question to you, right? So sustainable tourism working definition, we went through those things, right? Um, all sounds great, right? Integrate tourism with local communities in a respectful and functional way. Who, who would not want that? C provide authentic experiences, create lasting financial and social benefits, strong public policies that support um, the industry, contribute to the health environments in the natural environment. We probably all want those, right? Question is, how well do you think you're currently doing on those different dimensions? Just probing that, right? Just to kind of get a sense of where we think we're at in terms of if they're important, if they're important building blocks, um, how well are we performing? Who'd like to have a crack at that? No right or wrong answers. This is an exploration, right? To to see where we where we think we might sit in that set of uh, dimensions. What do you think we're doing well at? What do you think we're not doing so well at yet? This kind of gets the real part, right? 
And we want to have a real honest conversation, right? Because everybody here, we know tourism is important or extremely important to the future. But we know we've got to get that balance just right. I might need to be ignorant. Please. But um, I think educating the tourists of what's going on and what's available to do. If I didn't live here and some uh, many months of the year, um, I wouldn't know yeah. where what was happening, what to do. I'm not a big computer thing. So there's no, I don't know, maybe, maybe they have them over to the chamber, you know, pamphlets or, or all the um, restaurants, the, the Airbnbs, the businesses that could provide something in hand for tourists that may not have known that it was available yeah, or so, happening. So or we, we might have some of these, right? But yeah. we're not telling people about them. Well, yeah, if you don't know, you can't experience it. And, and then the danger of that is if you're not guiding people, you may be missing out on the opportunity to create financial benefits. Yeah. People may come, not know where to go, yeah, spend the money on. Yeah. You know, it's not a city. Yeah. You know, like you're not a city. That kind of city. And the reality <laughs> is that 90% of people increasingly are going to be from cities and have less knowledge and experience of places like this. Right, so they need to know where to yeah. go to do things. Yeah, so. very clear. Other people, how well do you think Newport's currently performing against those dimensions? <laughs> Let's do this, right? If you're doing well, let me know. So who thinks you're integrating tourism with local communities in a respectful and functional way? Who thinks you're doing really well on that? Okay, that's surprising, right? Don't take us on that one, right? Um, who thinks you're providing visitors with authentic experiences, grand and local reality? Who thinks you're doing that well? A couple of people, yeah. Say half the people. Well, it's hard not to, right? right. Yeah. You don't even have to actually do anything. You just <laughs> point them that way, right? Yeah. Creating lasting financial and social benefits. Who thinks you're doing that one? No takers on that one? Okay. Foster strong public policies with organisational support and funding. Who thinks you're doing that well? I think there's some people that are trying hard. Trying, definitely. Contributing to the health and vibrancy of the natural environment. Doing that well? Yeah. Low volumes of Low volumes, yeah, right? Low volumes to people, it's easy. Yeah. It's easy. It's okay. yeah. So by default, right? It may not be intentionally contributing, but but in sustainable tourism model you would think about, okay, how do we have tourism actually contribute as opposed to be we're not gonna mess it up, right? But we actually actually contribute and improve the natural environment. Alright, so most of you didn't think you were doing really well on those things, right? Um, I don't know what your takeaway from that is, but I would figure that's a little bit sobering, right? Um, <laughs> because I assume if you don't think you're doing well, you're either doing middling or not doing well at all, right? But, that, but if that's sobering, then I do think it's worthy of thinking about how do you build a pathway towards sustainable tourism. If you think those things are important, but you're not currently doing well, because it's really easy and really important, by the way, to build a lot of the products which you're doing a great job of. Part of what this is about is thinking about how you're collaborating, what focus you're putting on things, how you're thinking about and evolving your tourism economy and connecting that to your community. That's the part that you can sometimes forget in getting really busy by building the products and you know taking care of visitors, all those things. So those two things, I would argue or suggest are most powerful when they coexist. When you're building those experiences, building the products, but you're also taking account of what does this mean for our community? How's that going to shape our community? How do we spread the benefit of it? And so on, right? How do we make it that people feel that it's respectful and integrated and so on? All right, so now by the way, the good news on this is your responses were not particularly different from any of the other
communities that we're working with in the Rural Tourism uh, Academy. So whether that's from Gorham or you know, Burke or Island Pond, you know, those communities have all sort of said the same thing, although I didn't get the exact data on it, but none of them said they were doing that stuff really well, right? But there's room for improvement. And, and I would suggest and encourage you to think about getting on the game of that sooner rather than later. And the reason being is the world's coming at us hard and fast, right? We'll find out what that looks like in a month or two, right, in terms of this summer. Uh, but those macro trends are also going to be relentless. Okay, and they're going to keep changing and shaping your community. Um, but the opportunity is to get ahead of the curve and think about it and shape it the way you want it to go. Right? So, I want to finish that there. Um, Tracy, am I going to hand it back to you, or do you? See if there are any questions, questions yeah. and then I'll wrap up. Questions, then Rick will wrap up and we'll eat the rest of the food. <laughs> questions or thoughts, right? Okay, just intended to lay out some trends, ask some questions, provoke some thinking about the direction of tourism, um, and hopefully we can bake that into your activities going forward. So Rick, can I hand it back to you? Well, can we thank David for his time? And, and not just his time, but a really helpful overview that uh, brought up a lot of things that I hadn't really thought very carefully about. So I'm grateful, and I suspect I'm not the only one in the room who feels that way. So um, I just want to say what comes to mind in the moment is uh, when I first started in this position back in September, Laura Dolgan handed me the downtown, let's see if I get the name right, downtown and waterfront municipal plan, master plan? I've got it close, right? And said, this is my Bible and you should be looking at it all the time. And I've gone back to it on a regular basis. If you haven't seen it, it's quite a remarkable document. And it lays out a real vision that um, folks who are really being thoughtful and intentional about the, the future of the city of Newport are grounded in. And it makes me think, as you shared this afternoon, that um, some of you in the room can probably tell me that this has already been thought of. But I just need to say, I would really love a similar kind of plan that says, 10 years from now, this is where we want to be. What are the pieces that have to be put in place intentionally over that 10 year period? So for me, it opened me up, and I will be going home thinking about that. And I want to thank you for that. Um, I think I'll just finish with a round of thank yous. I'll say, first of all, we talked about maybe doing a Q&A for the last 10 minutes, or a, help us brainstorm about the future of downtown Newport and the businesses. I don't want to do that. Y'all have been really great about hanging in here for a long meeting this afternoon. I will say that you can find me through the Discover Newport VT website, discovernewportvt.com, and I am always open to constructive criticism and ideas, and I will do my best to be responsive, and every idea is a worthwhile idea, though not every idea may come to be or at least not come to be very quickly. So given that set of ground rules, if anyone has uh, input that you would like to offer to Newport City Downtown Development, please offer it. And if you would like to get into the mix of this conversation with Newport Rural Tourism Academy, it is an ongoing effort and we welcome your energy. And just let Tracy or myself or Laura or a number of us who are in the room, any of the folks from the uh, Northern Forest Center, let us know if you'd like to be involved. And we're grateful for the energy that you put in this afternoon. And I, I do want to say one more time what Tracy said earlier, which is that this initiative, this kind of bringing us all together in yet another iteration of folks who are caring about the, the future of this, this community, uh, would not have happened without the Northern Forest Center and their initiative around the Rural Tourism Academy. So we're really grateful to all of you who've made that happen. And anything else we need to add? Tracy, Laura, anything else you want to add? Okay, then the last thing I'm going to add is please do not leave me with six trays of food to take overnight. Take your plate and pile it with anything you think you might feed to your family so that no food goes to waste and I don't have to fit it all into the little tiny car that I had to borrow to get here this afternoon. Okay? And have a wonderful afternoon and evening and we'll be back in touch about next steps. Thanks so much.